Chapter Forty Seven of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter Forty Seven. Fatal Consequences. It was nearly two hours before daybreak, that time which in the autumn of the year may truly be called the dead of night, when the streets are silent and deserted, when even sounds appear to slumber, and profligacy and riot have staggered home to dream. It was at this still and silent hour that Fagin sat watching in his old lair, with a face so distorted and pale, and eyes so red and bloodshot, that he looked less like a man than like some hideous phantom, moist from the grave, and worried by an evil spirit. He sat crouching over a cold hearth, wrapped in an old torn coverlet, with his face turned towards a wasting candle that stood upon a table by his side. His right hand was raised to his lips, and as, absorbed in thought, he hit his long black nails, he disclosed among his toothless gums a few such fangs as should have been a dog's or rat's. Stretched upon a mattress on the floor lay Noah Claypole, fast asleep. Towards him the old man sometimes directed his eyes for an instant, and then brought them back again to the candle, which, with a long burnt wick drooping almost double, and hot grease falling down in clots upon the table, plainly showed that his thoughts were busy elsewhere. Indeed they were. Mortification at the overthrow of his notable scheme, hatred of the girl who had dared to palter with strangers, and utter distrust of the sincerity of her refusal to yield him up bitter disappointment at the loss of his revenge on Sykes. The fear of detection, and ruin, and death, and a fierce and deadly rage, kindled by all. These were the passionate considerations which, following close upon each other with rapid and ceaseless whirl, shot through the brain of Fagin, as every evil thought and blackest purpose lay working at his heart. He sat, without changing his attitude in the least, or appearing to take the smallest heed of time, until his quick ear seemed to be attracted by a footstep in the street. "'At last!' he muttered, wiping his dry and fevered mouth. "'At last!' The bell rang gently as he spoke. He crept upstairs to the door, and presently returned, accompanied by a man muffled to the chin, who carried a bundle under one arm. Sitting down and throwing back his outer coat, the man displayed the burly frame of Sykes. "'There!' he said, laying the bundle on the table. "'Take care of that, and do the most you can with it. It's been trouble enough to get. I thought I should have been here three hours ago.' Fagin laid his hand upon the bundle, and, locking it in the cupboard, sat down again without speaking. But he did not take his eyes off the robber, for an instant, during this action. And now that they sat over against each other, face to face, he looked fixedly at him with his lips quivering so violently, and his face so altered by the emotions which had mastered him, that the housebreaker involuntarily drew back in his chair, and surveyed him with a look of real affright. "'What now?' cried Sykes. "'What you look at a man so for?' Fagin raised his right hand, and shook his trembling forefinger in the air, but his passion was so great that the power of speech was for the moment gone. "'Damn!' said Sykes, feeling in his breast with a look of alarm. "'He's gone mad. I must look to myself here.' "'No, no,' rejoined Fagin, finding his voice. "'It's not—you're not the person, Bill. I've no—no no fault to find with you.' "'Oh, you haven't, haven't you?' said Sykes, looking sternly at him and ostentatiously passing a pistol into a more convenient pocket. "'That's lucky for one of us. Which one that is, don't matter. "'I've got that to tell you, Bill,' said Fagin, drawing his chair nearer. "'We'll make you worse than me.' "'Aye,' returned the robber, with an incredulous air. "'Tell away. Look sharp, or Nance will think I'm lost.' "'Lost?' cried Fagin. "'She has pretty well settled that in her own mind already.' 
Sykes looked with an aspect of great perplexity into the Jew's face, and, reading no satisfactory explanation of the riddle there, clenched his coat-collar in his huge hand, and shook him soundly. "'Speak, will you?' he said. "'Or if you don't, it shall be for want of breath. Open your mouth, and say what you've got to say, in plain words. Out with it, you thundering old cur, out with it!' "'Suppose that lad that's laying there,' Fagin began. Sykes turned round to where Noah was sleeping, as if he had not previously observed him. "'Well,' he said, resuming his former position. "'Suppose that lad,' pursued Fagin, "'was to peach, to blow upon us all, first seeking out the right folks for the purpose, and then having a meeting with them in the street, to paint our likeness, describe every mark that they might know us by, and the crib where we might be most easily taken. Suppose he was to do all this, and besides to blow upon a plant we've all been in, more or less, of his own fancy, not grabbed, trapped, tried, earwigged by the parson, and brought to it on bread and water, but of his own fancy, to please his own taste, stealing out at nights to find those most interested against us, and peaching to them. Do you hear me? cried the Jew, his eyes flashing with rage. Suppose he did all this. What then? What then? replied Sykes, with a tremendous oath. If he was left alive till I came, I'd grind his skull under the iron heel of my boot, and it was many grains as there are hairs upon his head. What if I did it? cried Fagin, almost in a yell. I, that know so much, and could hang so many besides myself. I don't know, replied Sykes, clenching his teeth and turning white at the mere suggestion. I'd do something in the jail that'd get me put in irons, and if I was tried along with you, I'd fall upon you with them in the open court, and beat your brains out afore the people. I should have such strength," muttered the robber, poising his brawny arm, that I could smash your head, as if a loaded wagon had gone over it. You would? Would I? said the housebreaker. Try me. If it was Charlie, or the Dodger, or Bet, or I don't care who, replied Sykes impatiently, whoever it was, I'd serve them the same. Fagin looked hard at the robber, and, motioning him to be silent, stooped over the bed upon the floor, and shook the sleeper to rouse him. Sykes leant forward in his chair, looking on with his hands upon his knees, as if wondering much what all this questioning and preparation was to end in. "'Bolter! Bolter! Poor lad!' said Fagin, looking up with an expression of devilish anticipation, and speaking slowly, and with marked emphasis. "'He's tired! Tired with watching for her so long! Watching for her, Bill!' "'What do you mean?' asked Sykes, drawing back. Fagin made no answer, but bending over the sleeper again, hauled him into a sitting posture. When his assumed name had been repeated several times, Noah rubbed his eyes, and, giving a heavy yawn, looked sleepily about him. "'Tell me that again, once again, just for him to hear,' said the Jew, pointing to Sykes as he spoke. "'Tell you what?' asked the sleepy Noah, shaking himself pettishly. "'That's about Nancy,' said Fagin, clutching Sykes by the wrist, as if to prevent his leaving the house before he had heard enough. "'You followed her? Yes. To London Bridge. Yes. Where she met two people. So she did.' A gentleman and a lady that she had gone to of her own accord before, who asked her to give up all her pals a monk's first, which she did, and to describe him, which she did, and to tell her what house it was that we meet at, and go to, which she did, 
and where it could be best watched from, which she did, and what time the people went there, which she did, she did all this. She told it all, every word without a threat, without a murmur, she did, did she not? cried Fagin, half mad with fury. All right, replied Noah, scratching his head. That's just what it was. What did they say about last Sunday? About last Sunday? replied Noah, considering. Why, I told you that before. Again, tell it again, cried Fagin, tightening his grasp on Sykes, and brandishing his other hand aloft as the foam flew from his lips. They asked her, said Noah, who, as he grew more wakeful, seemed to have a dawning perception who Sykes was. They asked her why she didn't come last Sunday as she promised. She said she couldn't. Why? Why? Tell him that. Because she was forcibly kept at home by Bill, the man she had told him of before, replied Noah. What more of him? cried Fagin. What more of the man she had told him of before? Tell him that. Tell him that. Why, that she couldn't very easily get out of doors unless he knew where she was a-going to, said Noah. And so, the first time she went to see the lady, she— <laughs> It made me laugh when she said it, that it did. She give him a drink of laudanum. Hell's fire! cried Sykes, breaking fiercely from the Jew. Let me go! Flinging the old man from him, he rushed from the room, and darted wildly and furiously up the stairs. Bill! Bill! cried Fagin, following him hastily. A word! Only a word! The word would not have been exchanged, but that the housebreaker was unable to open the door, on which he was expending fruitless oaths and violence, when the Jew came panting up. Let me out! said Sykes. Don't speak to me! It's not safe. Let me out, I say. Hear me speak a word, rejoined Fagin, laying his hand upon the lock. You won't be. Well, replied the other. You won't be too violent, Bill. The day was breaking, and there was light enough for the men to see each other's faces. They exchanged one brief glance. There was a fire in the eyes of both, which could not be mistaken. I mean, said Fagin, showing that he felt all disguise was now useless, not too violent for safety. Be crafty, Bill, and not too bold. Sykes made no reply, but, pulling open the door, of which Fagin had turned the lock, dashed into the silent streets. Without one pause or moment's consideration, without once turning his head to the right or left, or raising his eyes to the sky, or lowering them to the ground, but looking straight before him with savage resolution, his teeth so tightly compressed that the strained jaw seemed starting through his skin. The robber held on his headlong course, not muttered a word, nor relaxed a muscle, until he reached his own door. He opened it, softly, with a key, strode lightly up the stairs, and entering his own room, double-locked the door, and lifting a heavy table against it, drew back the curtain of the bed. The girl was lying, half-dressed upon it. He had roused her from her sleep, for she raised herself with a hurried and startled look. "'Get up!' said the man. "'It is you, Bill,' said the girl, with an expression of pleasure at his return. "'It is,' was the reply. "'Get up!' There was a candle burning, but the man hastily drew it from the candlestick, and hurled it under the grate. Seeing the faint light of early day without, the girl rose to undraw the curtain. "'Let it be,' said Sykes, thrusting his hand before her. "'There's enough light for what I've got to do.' "'Bill,' said the girl, in the low voice of alarm, "'why'd you look like that at me?' The robber sat regarding her for a few seconds, with dilated nostrils and heaving breast, and then, grasping her by the head and throat, dragged her into the middle of the room, and looking once towards the door, placed his heavy hand upon her mouth. "'Bill! Bill!' gasped the girl, wrestling with the strength of mortal fear. "'I... I won't scream or cry, not once. Hear me, 
speak to me. Tell me what I've done. You know, you she-devil, returned the robber, suppressing his breath. You were watched to-night. Every word you said was heard. <gasps> then spare my life for the love of heaven, as I spared yours, rejoined the girl, clinging to him. Bill, dear Bill, you cannot have the art to kill me. Oh, think of all I have given up, only this one night, for you. You shall have time to think and save yourself this crime. I will not lose my hold. You cannot throw me off. Bill, Bill, for dear God's sake, for your own, for mine, stop before you spill my blood. I've been true to you. Upon my guilty soul I have." The man struggled violently to release his arms, but those of the girl were clasped round his, and tear her as he would, he could not tear them away. "'Bill!' cried the girl, striving to lay her head upon his breast. "'The gentleman and that dear lady told me to-night of a home in some foreign country, where I could end my days in solitude and peace. Let me see them again, and beg them, on my knees, to show the same mercy and goodness to you, and let us both leave this dreadful place, and far apart lead better lives, and forget how we have lived, except in prayers, and never see each other more. It is never too late to repent. They told me so. I feel it now. But we must have time, a, a little, little time. The housebreaker freed one arm, and grasped his pistol. The certainty of immediate detection if he fired flashed across his mind, even in the midst of his fury, and he beat it twice, with all the force he could summon, upon the upturned face that almost touched his own. She staggered and fell, nearly blinded with the blood that rained down from a deep gash in her forehead, but raising herself with difficulty on her knees drew from her bosom a white handkerchief, Rose Maylie's own, and holding it up in her folded hands as high towards heaven as her feeble strength would allow, breathed one prayer for mercy to her Maker. It was a ghastly figure to look upon, the murderer staggering backward to the wall, and shutting out the sight with his hand, seized a heavy club, and struck her down. End of chapter 47